Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Corps. Now you know me, I love to test any sort of handheld that comes my way. Today we're going to take a look at the new Pikto streaming handheld device. And when I say streaming, I mean exactly that when it comes to this handheld. In fact, this device has no chip running inside, it's literally just a monitor with a special receiver. And that receiver is getting a signal directly from a transmitter that's hooked up to the HDMI port on whatever device you want to use it with. And so if anything, if you're trying to wrap your head around this concept, I would think of it much like a wireless HDMI my cable hooked up to a handheld device. And so all of that processing power, the gameplay and everything else is going to be done on whatever device you have it hooked up to. And so in this video we're going to take a look at the entire concept here. We have this wireless monitor and then the controllers hooked up to that. And in the end I found that there were quite a few hoops you had to jump through in order to get a good gameplay experience. But all things considered, I do think there's a use case that might be of interest to some people. And so without any further delay, let's jump right in. Okay, to start, this device is currently part of a Kickstarter campaign that's going to be wrapping up in the next two weeks. And the campaign has already reached its goal with a little bit less than 200 backers altogether. Now currently, the cheapest you can find it with their super early bird pricing is about $275. But after this section fills up, the next lowest price is going to be $335. And so bear in mind, this technology is not cheap and this handheld isn't either. In fact, the advertised MSRP for this device is going to be $500 US. And so keep that price in mind as we're walking through this review because it is not for the faint of heart. Now to get an understanding of what's working under the hood here, let's talk a little bit about the technology that they're using. And this is called MM Wave, which runs at a 60 gigahertz signal. And so for you mathematicians out there, that's going to be about 10 times the typical bandwidth you would get from a Wi-Fi 6 signal. And so as they're advertising it here, the transmission rate is going to be about 4 gigabits per second. But bear in mind, this is going to be a very high frequency range, which means it's going to be a short wave signal. And you'll see when it comes to practical use, that means it's going to have to have line of sight communication in order to have that signal transmit. Either way, what it comes down to is that the transmission rate will be so high that there won't be any sort of input lag or anything else like that. And again, we'll test that here later in the video. For now, let's jump into the unboxing. Now, this is a test unit sent over to me by Pikdo, and so this will not be the final retail unit when it actually starts shipping in March. For now, let's take a look at what we have inside. So this has a USB-C video cable, as well as a USB-C charging cable here. Additionally, we have a second charging cable. This is going to power our transmitter. And then we have another cable for HDMI. We'll talk about the uses for these here in a moment. Mine also came with a right angle HDMI adapter which will come in handy. And next we have the power plug to charge the device itself. And next we have one of the stars of the show. This is the HDMI transmitter. And this transmitter is not cheap. This thing runs for about $200 retail from Pikdo themselves. It's going to be powered by USB-C and then it has one connection button here on the top. And then finally we have a USB wireless Bluetooth adapter. This is going to allow us to connect to our controllers without having to mess with any of the Bluetooth settings. And so with all of that out of the way, let's actually talk about the device itself. First impressions here, it is very impressively large. We have a 7 inch screen right here and it is pretty hefty. It's a little bit less than 400 grams. When actually picking up the device, the first thing I noticed is how big and thick these grips are on each side. These are very chunky. In fact, some of the chunkiest grips that I've felt on a dedicated handheld like this. And because the grips are so big, it distributes the weight really well. And so it kind of behaves a little bit like a Steam Deck in the fact that it is kind of big and heavy, but it's distributed in a way that doesn't feel like it. Now, unfortunately, the plastic they're using on these grips is kind of slick. In fact, it's a little bit slippery as you play it over time. And so I do wish that these had a little bit more grit to them. But overall, I would say that this device is surprisingly ergonomic and comfortable in the hand. Part of that has to do with the fact that the device itself is relatively slim. And so when you combine that with those larger grips, it just feels really nice and ergonomic. Now the big surprise for me here as I started to kind of pick this thing apart is that they're actually just using third party Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. And so these things actually just slide out like they would any other Joy-Con. And in the end I actually kind of like this concept because any Joy-Con will work with this device. But that being said, let's take a look at the ones that do come with it. We'll start with the shoulder and trigger buttons. First thing off the bat is that because it's using Joy-Cons, it has a digital trigger input. That means it's either on or off. There's no in-between like an analog signal. And that will come into play with certain games. We'll talk about that more when we do the testing. Both the shoulder and the trigger buttons are relatively clicky. I think if you've ever held a Joy-Con, you should know what to expect when it comes to these two buttons. I'd say they take a little bit more force than a first-party Joy-Con, but not that much. 
Up here near the top, we have a minus or select button. And this one has a dome switch connection, much like with any other Joy-Con. Now let's talk about these analog sticks. These have a pretty good range to them and they do click down on L3 and R3. I'd say these sticks are a little bit smaller than what you would find on an Xbox controller, but they're definitely bigger than what you would find on a Joy-Con. The texture on them is a little bit slick and kind of cheap feeling. I wish they were a little bit grippier. Overall, I would say they're better than a Joy-Con analog stick, but worse than something you'd find on an Xbox or DualSense controller. Now the D-pad here is in a cross pattern and has a dome switch connection as well. It feels very clicky and precise. The travel on them is relatively low and it does take a little bit of aggressive push in order to get them to register. But overall, I wouldn't say this is a bad D-pad. It has a nice little bit of sloping to it from the center out to the edges. And so because of that, it is pretty easy to roll and pivot. And so yeah, I think it works fine. We've got a couple different menu buttons here on the bottom. These function basically as a screenshot and a home button depending on what platform you're using it with. And these Joy-Cons do light up red when you're using them. Now let's talk about the face buttons on the other side. These have a rubber membrane connection and are a little bit small and kind of slick as well, but overall I would say they're actually pretty good buttons. The travel on them is a little bit shallower than most other controllers, but not bad overall. And of course the other buttons and components here on the right side are the same as on the left. One interesting thing here is that each of these Joy-Cons have their own charging port. And so if you wanted to charge up this device all at once, you'd have to have three different cables, two for the Joy-Cons and one for the device itself. Now, additionally, I thought that these two bottom holes right here were the speakers, but as you'll see later, these are not them. It also weirdly has a tripod mount right here if you'd ever want to use that. Now let's take a look at the back. Most important here is the wireless receiver. This is what's going to take in that signal from the HDMI transmitter we looked at earlier. And then this here in the center, this is the speaker. So we have one single mono speaker on this monitor. Okay, taking a look at the top here, I want you to think of this kind of like a portable monitor. So we have our power button and then our menu back button and then our up and down, which can navigate the menu, but can also control the volume. We also have a headphone jack and what looks to be a light sensor or maybe a microphone. And then this here is a port for heat ventilation. It does get pretty warm after extended use. Then finally, we have our power input as well as video transmit signals for USB-C and HDMI in. And so if you wanted, you could actually just hook this up wired instead of using the wireless transmitter if you'd like. Now let's take a look at the screen. This is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, 7 inches, and a 1080p resolution. It also gives off 400 nits of brightness, and as you can see, it has relatively large bezels. Now, according to their Kickstarter, they're going to be using a better screen when they actually ship out the retail units. And so as you can see here, it's going to have some smaller bezels on each side. And we should see some improvements when it comes to things like brightness and screen response time. And we should get about 20% better battery life too. Now, one thing to note is that the test model that I'm using does not have a touch screen, but they say that if conditions allow, they will be adding a touch screen. Bear in mind, they're not guaranteeing a new touch screen, but it is something that they are interested in looking into. One other note here is the test monitor I'm using actually has a metal backing to it. And honestly, I kind of like this metal feel. It gives it a more rugged and durable kind of feel to it. Overall, when it comes to my impressions of the hardware too, it's actually kind of interesting. Number one, I think they use the best possible size when it comes to Joy-Cons for this whole concept. And I do like the fact that they use Joy-Cons in the first place because it means they'll be easily replaceable if something goes wrong. I like these big fat grips on here, but I do wish the plastic wasn't so slick. But other than that, I really don't have any complaints about the controls. In fact, this controls a lot better than most of the handhelds that I've tested over the past couple of years. And so when it comes to just overall ergonomics and comfort, yeah, this is something I would totally want to play on. In the end, the three major components to this are going to be the wireless handheld itself and then that HDMI transmitter. This will transmit that signal directly to the device and then we'll use this wireless USB dongle right here to connect our controllers to everything in between. Now when we plug this in you can see it's behaving exactly like some sort of portable monitor. And when you get into the menu you can see that the monitor functions here are exactly like you would expect. So you have the option to switch between the different input methods and you do have options to change things like brightness, contrast, and volume and you can even change the color balance if you'd like as well. Now I'm not sure if this is going to change with the retail units so I don't want to spend too much time on it here but my point is here to highlight the fact that many of these components are actually third-party things that you could pick up off the shelf. We're essentially just going to be using a battery-powered portable monitor and then also some third-party Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. But what I find most interesting about this project is that they're taking all these components together and building something that's wholly unique. And so let's move over to my favorite part of the video, which is the actual testing. To start, we're going to do some PC game testing. I'm going to use a mini PC from Mini's forum. This one's called the TH50. Now in terms of components, we're just going to use the very basics. So we have the device itself, 
then that wireless HDMI transmitter, plus a cable to power that transmitter, and then also an HDMI adapter so that we can get it at the right angle. And then finally, we'll have that Bluetooth adapter so we can connect everything up really easily. Now, if we try to hook up the transmitter without the adapter, you can see here, it's just gonna face straight up. And so in this case, we are gonna use that adapter to point the transmitter signal directly to the device. And then of course, we use the USB cable here plugged into the back of the computer to power everything up. So let's go ahead and get the signal working first and then we'll work on the control adapter next. And to get everything connected, it is relatively seamless. You would just tap on that little button at the top of the transmitter and then turn on your PC and then everything should connect. It does take a moment for the monitor to register the signal, but then after that, it should be relatively stable. However, one thing to note here is due to the lack of touchscreen, this is basically impossible to navigate once you actually get into the computer. My workaround for this is to actually have it start with Steam in big picture mode when the computer starts. And so that means you could just navigate everything with the controller and no need for a mouse or keyboard or anything else like that. And so now let's get the controllers hooked up so we can actually navigate the system. To set this up, we're gonna plug in that USB adapter, and then we wanna connect the left Joy-Con first. And pairing this is almost exactly like you would on a Nintendo Switch, so we'll press the connection button, and then we'll tap on the button on the wireless receiver, and yeah, now we're paired up. Now to get the second controller working, we're gonna to have to hold on to the L and R buttons here on the first Joy-Con, and then that'll run the reconnection sequence, and then we can connect that second adapter here. And so now we have both of these controllers connected to that Bluetooth adapter and we can navigate through our system and start playing some games. And when it comes to actual gameplay with the streaming set up perfectly, yeah, it actually is very impressive. The streaming quality here is super crisp. We're getting a good 1080p signal here with no sorts of artifacting at all. And when it comes to input delay, I can't perceive any of this either. Bear in mind that the weak link when it comes to streaming right here is not actually the screen or the visuals, but actually the Bluetooth controllers. But even then, when using this wireless dongle, yeah, it feels really great. And just to confirm here, yes, this is only a single mono speaker. Let me give you a quick audio test right here. Now the room I'm testing in is only about 20 feet altogether in length, and as long as I kept a good line of sight, I didn't have any sort of hiccups or issues with the streaming. And so what I wanted to do next was to test whether or not I could kind of push that line of sight as much as I could. And so as you can see, when I start to angle it a little bit away from the device, I do get some blackouts here and there. And then if I push it all the way to about a 90 degree difference, you can see it completely blacks out. And so if you're looking for a solution where you could stream at a weird angle or between a wall, then this really is not gonna work. And again, we're using a shortwave signal here, which means it's gonna have to have a direct communication from the transmitter to the receiver. And so unless you're directly facing the transmitter itself, then I would expect to have some blackouts here and there. And I will say that this completely transforms the gaming experience when you do have these intermittent blackouts like this. It's kind of interesting how you can go from being very surprised and amazed at how well this will work when it does, to being completely frustrated when it starts blacking out and your character starts dying because you can't see what's going on. And so in my testing I found that I had some mixed emotions. When everything was hooked up correctly and I had a direct line of sight, yeah, it was really impressive. In fact, I got to the point where I kept forgetting that I was actually streaming in the first place. That's how well it worked. Now, along with the transmission signal issues, there was one other thing that kind of left me scratching my head. And that was that in some of these games, these two Joy-Cons would actually register as two different controllers no matter what I did. And so for example, with Ninja Turtles, I didn't have any other option but to select two different characters at the same time. And these two characters would actually get controlled in the same way, which kind of made it a little bit interesting when it came to gameplay. But either way, I did find that to be a little bit weird and the fact that these two controllers, even though they worked as one, actually registered as two different controllers in some games. And just to verify here, you can use any other Joy-Con and yeah, they'll work just fine with the Picto device. And so for example, if I wanted to use my first party Switch OLED controllers here, yeah, they'll work. But for me personally, I do prefer the chunky grips on these third party ones, so I'm gonna stick with those. And so that was PC game streaming. We're gonna work on the Xbox Series S next. And the Picto could essentially be used with any sort of device that has an HDMI output. And so while we're using the Xbox here, you could do the same thing with a PlayStation 4 or 5 or whatever else you'd like. Now the thing about the Xbox and the PlayStation is that they use a wireless signal that has to be licensed. And so because of that, you can't take a wireless third-party controller like these two Joy-Cons and connect them up to an Xbox just like that. 
And so you could use a couple different options here. The first would be to use a wireless first party controller like from the Xbox or PlayStation. But of course, bear in mind that it wouldn't really be like a handheld scenario at that point, it'll just be a wireless tablet and a controller. And so if you want to actually use these Joy-Cons with an Xbox or PlayStation, you'll have to use a third party licensed dongle. And luckily I just happen to have the wingman converter for the Xbox that I got from Brooke. I had the pleasure of meeting up with these folks during CES and they gave me one of these to use in a video. And so I think it's a good time to do it now. This adapter here allows you to use a number of different third party controllers with any of the Xbox systems wirelessly. And so because the wireless adapter that came with the Picto actually registers as an Xbox One controller, this should work out just fine. And so here I am connecting the wingman up to the USB adapter and then trying to connect it here. And yeah, it works just great. And so now we're able to play on the Xbox Series S using the third party controllers and the entire device. And so at this point, we've made a remote play option available for the Xbox with much lower latency than it would if you did it over Wi-Fi. And yeah, I gotta say it works out really well. Here I am playing Destiny 2 and it feels really, really good. This is easily the best looking and fastest playing streaming setup that I've ever tried. Now, by virtue of using these controllers, it's not gonna be a perfect experience with some games. For example, with a driving game like Forza Horizon 5, this game benefits from having an analog input on the gas and brakes. And so because we're using a digital input for the triggers with these controllers, that means we only have two options. We can either push on the gas 100% or 0% and there's nothing in between. And for a game like this that requires a little bit more precision, it does feel like less than a stellar experience. And so I would say yes, the Xbox experience here actually was really good and I enjoyed it more than on the PC. But I was limited with some games that relied on an analog input for the triggers. That just wasn't something that was possible with these controllers. Okay, so that's about it when it comes to testing. Let's start in the summary section and talk about what I like and what I don't like. To start, one of my favorite things was the streaming once I had everything hooked up. This was easily the best streaming experience I'd had when coming from Xbox Remote Play and even with my PC. The latency here had to completely disappeared and the image itself was a very crisp 1080p with no artifacting. Additionally, I really like these Joy-Cons. They're a little bit slick to the touch, but other than that, they're super comfortable. In fact, when it came to overall ergonomics and just comfort over long periods of time, this rivaled something like the Steam Deck or the Logitech Cloud. And so in the end, I think that Picto did a very good job picking these particular Joy-Cons for their device. Now this device has quite a few flaws, so let's talk about some of the things I didn't like about this one. Number one, we are very limited by the line of sight transmission that we can get here. I was able to test up to 20 feet away with absolutely no problem if I had direct line of sight. However, if I tried to move at an angle or tried to go through a wall or something like that, the performance would completely tank. Not only that, the initial setup on this is a little bit wonky. For example, with a lack of touchscreen, it means it's very kind of difficult to navigate through a computer and setting up that initial connection with the Joy-Cons is kind of a pain in the butt. Additionally, I would say the battery life here left a little bit to be desired. On average, in the week of testing that I did, I got about two and a half hours of battery life across the board. Now that's gonna be enough time to be able to sit down and watch a movie with your significant other while also playing a game in the living room. But if you wanna play any longer than that, you're probably gonna to wanna to have a battery pack or charging cable handy. Now, as much as I like the controllers that came with the device, I wish that the triggers themselves had an analog input. Personally, I found that my favorite use case with this device was actually playing Xbox Remote Play. And there are many games that rely on analog triggers and I'd like to be able to play those ones too. In the end, I think there were two things that really set me back about the Picto wireless device. Number one is the price. At $500 for their retail price, I just don't think that's realistic. And even the early bird Kickstarter pricing of between $275 and $350, that also seems really expensive too. And that's because in the end, all of these things combined together means that we have a very niche use case. In the week that I spent testing this device, I kind of racked my brain to find when I would actually want to use this and when it would actually make sense at that price. And in the end, I really only came up with one solution. And to get to that situation, I had to come up with a couple different assumptions. Number one, I have to assume that whatever you want to transmit from is going to be located in your living room or somewhere else that you have easy access to with a line of sight. And so in this case, I'm just going to assume that you're going to be using an Xbox Series S like the one here. The next assumption here is that you cannot play on the TV that you have hooked up in the living room because you're going to be using it for something else like watching a movie with your significant other or something like that. And so if you 
you are going to be watching TV, but you also want to play on a handheld, then this might make some sense. But there's also a couple other assumptions. One is that you don't have a handheld that you could play anyway. For example, you don't already have something like the Steam Deck or even a cheaper handheld that you can play older games on. And then next, I also have to make the assumption that you don't want to do any sort of Wi-Fi streaming. So you don't want to use something like the Logitech Cloud or your phone to stream the game that way. And so in the end, if all those assumptions combine into a situation that makes sense for you, and you want to have the most powerful streaming option available and you don't really mind that higher price, then yes, I could say that maybe the peak dough is something you should be interested in checking out. But for everybody else, I think there are many other ways to skin this cat. For example, you could use a cheaper handheld to play games while you're watching TV. Additionally, you could use something like remote play on your phone using a telescopic controller for a lot cheaper too. And so in the end, I do find this hard to recommend just based on the price and the fact that it has some very specific parameters to work correctly. But either way, I did find this technology to be pretty cool and it was fun to test. And so let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you interested in picking this up or what things need to change for you to reconsider it? And I'll leave a link to the Kickstarter campaign below as well as that USB adapter from Brook that I found really handy. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.